Hey, Josh, what's going on? I'm so happy to have you here on the podcast again and see you for the fifth time in the past week. So uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And if you could introduce yourself, tell us what you do and tell us why you're here today. Uh, my name is Josh Stiles. I'm the owner of this little company called Shama Sandals. Um, I'm somebody that is, I would say, a barefoot minimalist uh, enthusiast. I have been for about 13, 14 years now. And so it's something that I, I really, I love running and just going to turn my phone off. <laughs> no worries. Uh, something I love to do. And uh, it was, I, I, I guess you just call it a passion. Uh, and about 10 or about 11 years ago, I just decided to turn it into a business and, you know, try my hand at it. And uh, here I am, 10 years later, talking to you. So uh, I guess something's going right, but so that's why I'm here. Well, I, I guess that... you know, if you ask me who I am, I would really want to say quickly, uh, I'm a father of four uh, beautiful girls, and I have a lovely wife, and uh, I've got my uh, a great dog. Um, and so those things, actually, I would put above all of that. Uh, so I think that that's the most important stuff. So basically human being first, sandal dude second, and uh, yeah, entrepreneur third, business owner third, fourth. Uh, wow, that's awesome. So happy to connect here and finally have this much-awaited podcast together. I found that uh, people who monetize their passions are usually tend to be very successful because they're not doing it out of money or greed. They're doing it out of passion. Like this is something they're really enthusiastic about. And you see your passion on your social media channel, on our random Instagram video calls, like you're fully bought into what you do. And I think that's what makes it so great. So Josh, uh, you're a pretty, pretty, um, you're a trail runner, right? You're, you run, you're not just a sandal maker. You're actually quite the athlete. So um, I think we want, yeah. I don't, I don't know how good of an athlete I am. I'm 43. Uh, I'm somebody that's always loved sports. I, I started a little late. I started it like I had this plan when I was a kid. All I wanted to do was just play, uh, or no, no, like watch the cartoons in the afternoon after I got home from school. And then my mom, when I was seven, she was like, oh, we're not doing that anymore. And so she put me in soccer. I loved it. Um, then she put me in, uh, t-ball and I loved it. And ever since then, I've, I've just really enjoyed sports. I don't have an illustrious career. I just played Little League, and I played um, rec soccer, and then I played uh, – I went to a small college, and I was fortunate enough. And so I played through high school. I played baseball, and I got to play some baseball in, in college, and I got to um, play some soccer there as well, some club soccer. So we – travel around and play different colleges and their club teams. And uh, I've just always been active. It could have been disc golf. Um, I love football too. I would play, I played touch football. I never played like actual, like for a team, but into my thirties, every Sunday after church or on Saturdays, we would play um, like a serious, like hours of touch football. It was just so much fun. So I've always been active. I've always moved. I kind of hated to run. Running was like what you had to do to play the sport. I had a buddy say, uh, he was a big guy. He looked like Brock Lesnar. And I'm serious. He, he was like 290 pounds, big man. He's like, I only like to run when I'm chasing a ball. And I, like, I kind of felt like that was sort of, that encapsulated my approach to running. Um, when I started dating my wife, she liked to run and I would run with her but running wasn't something I was really interested in. And then I was kind of getting heavier. Um, I was playing men's slow pitch softball, something that, uh, you know, I played pretty competitively. Everyone that was out at the league I had played at had played at least high school ball. Most of them had played in uh, baseball in college. And like, when you get older, you play softball now. Just fun, but competitive, right? And some guy was out there and I was, I was like 30 at the time. And some guy was playing center field wearing what I thought were booties. So if those of you that don't know, Santa Cruz, California, we're about 80 miles south of San Francisco. We're in the Monterey Bay. 
and it, this is like the home of wetsuits, uh, O'Neill wetsuits. Jack O'Neill developed the wetsuit here. Like surfing is part of the culture. So I thought this guy's just like wearing booties, but we're all competing. You don't wear booties. Turns out he was wearing five fingers like around 2010 ish. And like he was trying to put it into his softball, you know, to get some advantage or health thing or whatever. And uh, so I, I looked it up. I got, I, I was like, what, what is this that he's doing? I figured it out. And then as soon as I realized that like the concept behind um, the minimalist footwear or the, the five fingers, I was like, that makes perfect sense. It's just unlocking your foot, um, unlocking, you know, this, this, uh, I don't know how superpower. else to say it. Superpower. 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 superpower, yeah, man. It, you know, you have this incredible equipment. Um, I found myself, I was listening to a podcast I did uh, with Strict Vision a little while ago. And I always find myself like bringing up the robots because you've seen like the dancing robots and like from Boston Dynamics and stuff. And I always mention that they, they scare me because, you know, with AI and guns, it's just Terminator 2 at some point. But I, I make that point because the the amount of technology that it would take to replicate what the human foot does is is still as good as those robots are a human foot is so amazing and dynamic and perfect and hardwired into your being and you look at what nike wants to give you and it's literally all right let's and let's stop your foot from moving being dynamic and then change the way that that you're gonna run now. And we'll do that for 120 bucks or 140 bucks. And this foam is the technology instead of your hardwired in incredible feet. And so it's like, I got it early on. I made a lot of mistakes, but I realized there was something very different and I wanted to do it so that I could, not just that I enjoy, I really enjoy running um, and be, being like a distance trail street runner, but um, I wanted to continue to move throughout life. Um, I didn't want to like, at the time I got into it, I was definitely getting heavier. I wasn't, you know, super heavy, but I was like, I'm like 195 pounds now. I was about 115, like I was stacking on that 20 and then who knows, it might've been 30 or 40. Um, and, uh, and I knew it was like, I got to make a change in how I'm approaching life and I want to be able to move throughout life. So that's kind of a big goal of mine just to, to enjoy life, to be part of it. Again, that's, that's the, the human part. <laughs> and um, I'll just add on to that. I have a deep concern for our humanity right now when it comes to um, we're sort of, you see, you see like whether it's pharmaceuticals or food or phones and AI, all of it, it's kind of like pulling us away from what we were. And it's like this promise of, oh, things are going to be better. But then you look around and people are like hunched over on their phone, anxious, depressed, disconnected, not moving eating foods that they have never eaten before in human history and somehow being told that's better or that's a good life. And I think that people need to reconnect with their faith, have strong family ties and move and do things that we've always done wherever you're from, whatever your traditions are and connect with those. I think that's super important. And so with the sandals, I'm really happy it makes me very happy to know that we're helping people be more human. Um, so I just think it's part of like this bigger thing. Society is going to go one way or the other. I know we're supposed to talk about sandals, but um, that's like a, a pressing issue for me. Or spoken, a deep like a, spoken like a true oh, advocate. Yeah. We're just people who tend to be minimalist leaning or barefoot friendly, tend to be more holistic and connected to themselves. And that could yeah. be because these same holistic people started seeking out barefoot, or it could be that as they began on their barefoot journey, it actually made them a more holistic person. And I fall into it, that second, the second category. Yeah, it, it, it did. 
it, and I was not somebody that was like the food pharmaceutical kind of guy. Um, but I, it's like once you, once it kind of unwinds a little bit and you start looking at, you know, like, okay, the, the shoe industry is trying to change me as my foot and the way I move. Um, I had some, some headaches and I was trying to figure out this, this headache thing like about eight or nine years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. And uh, I started looking into like migraine type of stuff or whatever. And I was thinking maybe it's monosodium glutamate or something like that, you know, in my food or some preservatives. And I'd never really like worried about that stuff before. And then I just started looking like, I know this is silly, but I'd look at, I think I wanted some, it was blue cheese, right? Blue cheese can cause migraines, that kind of thing. And I was starting to like pay attention to the, like, well, what's in the salad dressing? And you look at the back of it and like, like there's nothing oh, in here that a, a human should be eating. It should be eating. And then you look at like what, <laughs> what our salad dressing was like, if you just made it from scratch and they're two completely different things. And that, I know it's kind of silly, but that's how it is for me. Um, I'm sorry, I'll throw one more out. My wife would hate me for this, but I'm like a, a ice cream snob. I came home from the supermarket one day and I was looking at my, my ice cream and it said frozen dairy dessert. I was like, frozen dairy dessert? Like I, I look at labels, man. I look at all of them and I just I'm like, so if you don't have enough fat content, you can't actually call it ice cream. And so to me, it's like, oh, this is their scam. Everybody's running a scam. And the scam is that like, let's just load it with sugar and candy and whatever garbage you can put. And, uh, and then we'll kind of just hide it there and no one will look that it's frozen dairy dessert and no one does. And it's scary, but it's the same concept with, with your footwear. Some guy from Nike, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm whatever. We're going to get sued by him now. I don't know. But some marketing department at a big shoe company um, is like, this is the look you want. This is the foam, fresh foam, whatever the, the thing, the saying is. And um, it doesn't matter whether it's good for you or not, or it has any relationship to the way you move or your feet work. So I don't know. That's kind of like, that's who I am. I'm a weirdo. Uh, but I have concern, concern for folks. You know, so the good news is, is that I'm a weirdo right along with you. In fact, uh, ketchup here in Israel, in order to be labeled ketchup has to be at least like, don't quote me on this one. I think 80 to 90 percent tomatoes. And because <laughs> Heinz ketchup now Heinz and Nike are going to sue us is there's more sugar in there than tomatoes. It actually <laughs> has to be labeled as tomato based condiment instead of ketchup. It's the same stuff. And my philosophy is if you didn't grow it yourself or you don't know the person who grew it. You better be reading that label because you, you really be don't reading. know. You really don't know what's in it. And it's so deceptive. Like this world of healthy bars, like like a, a company could be called health bars, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I do want to I do want to delve into the uh, running world a bit because sure, sure. I'm curious. You mentioned you grew up in sports. I also I think we share that passion. In fact, if you can make it here within 45 minutes, you can actually play barefoot ultimate frisbee for three hours. A good three quarters of us are without shoes. Um, for me, it's not just the barefoot sports. It's actually, um, so I have my router next to me. I'm using Bluetooth headphones. I'm, I have my laptop. And like, hocus pocus or not, after triple doses of whatever stuff are flying yeah. in my brain cells, three hours of grounding, like playing barefoot on Frisbee, I come back like a new man. Like I yes. physically feel the changes and you can call it placebo, you can call it whatever, but there's something to this spending time outdoors barefoot like it's definitely not just this hocus pocus thing that people want to say it is um i do want to ask you but you grew up in sports and you always did not like running but now you're this 43 year old man who who you know it creates minimalist running sandals and hits the trails every week what what changed how did you transition from baseball softball to uh this runner dude well i think the biggest change um uh, and the this is the real thing with it, again yeah like is it hocus pocus and that's the hard thing for all of us to determine in all these different areas in our lives but uh it is not hocus pocus um what happened for me right away with with barefoot 
was that it shortened my stride and it changed the foot strike. And when you do that, you're gonna, when you have a shorter stride and your, your foot strike is softer, it's gonna be more comfortable and then you can also breathe. So the sh I see people working so hard when they're running and they, <laughs> they look like they're dying, you know, they pretty much are. Because if you're landing, um, basically what the, obviously what the, the big padding on your, your shoe, you know, a lot of these shoes, what it will do for you is allow you to land farther out in front and they, it's encouraging you to land on the heel, essentially, right. which is not how you run. No one runs like that. We run, so I want to say this real quick. So we run prob probably four foot is sprinting. Cool. And then the middle of the foot is, um, is like what we'd call running or jogging. And then we walk on our heel. So right there, that's insane that a human has like three modes of movement, like three basic modes. And it's more than that because, um, what am I, so in, in your car, you have this thing called a, a power band. And what it means is like, as you accelerate, you have a camshaft in there that dictates how um, the, the valves in the engine, like when they open and, and for how long they're open. And each camshaft, so it's like, it's like a lobe, it rotates around and then it opens the valve at the right time. Well, every car basically has this, like a, a strong point at which they are, they're most capable, they're, they're, you're gonna get the most power. Say it's like at 4,000 RPMs, they're opened up and you know, uh, the, the car's moving, you're gonna have your most power. Well, you can change that camshaft. And like, if you had a diesel truck, you might want it lower so you have more torque, you know, when you first start, cause you're pulling a heavy load. Well, humans can do that too. So just because I said, well, forefoot, midfoot, heel, within that um, that foot, you're gonna change depending on the speed. It's gonna come, you know, you're gonna start landing farther back the slower you're going. And you say, well, Josh, now you're back on your heel and you're landing on your heel if you're, if you're landing farther back uh, in the midfoot. Not so, your metatarsal runs a long way back towards the heel. So you can still be in the middle of the foot. So anyways, um, it's, it's, where am I going with this? It's not hocus pocus. What happens is that as you change your foot strike, um, it's a radical change from what the running shoe companies want you to do. So they want you to land on the heel, which is actually would be like a braking position. If you had to hit the brakes really quick when you were running or stopping, you dig your heels in. You don't want to run there. You you actually can't even run there. I did a reel a week ago or a couple of weeks ago where I tried to run on my heels. It's ridiculous. It's impossible. No can, it's, it's virtually impossible if you're barefoot or wearing minimalist footwear. It's extremely uncomfortable and it just doesn't feel natural unless you're wearing feel... sneakers. Exactly. And so now you look at a running shoe and uh, so basically it just kind of creates a mess. What they've found is According to what I've read, um, even though like a shoe is angled, right, heel toe, a, a lot of these running shoes, what people will do. You're talking about you, the drop, like the heel the drop, toe elevation? The heel toe drop. You think yeah. to yourself, well, why don't they just, all right, it's got the heel toe drop and I don't run on my heel. Why don't I just land on the front of my foot and I'll still just be kind of angled weird? Why doesn't it work? Well, some people do that and they do a pretty good job, but it's this, it's this totally other system that's built into us that kind of takes over. And that is that if your body knows you're landing on something soft and squishy, you will straighten your leg out. Try running on a trampoline. If you were just run around on a trampoline, you'd be way more straight legged than you normally would run. And the reason is, because your body needs to find something firm. It needs to find a firm foundation on the ground before it can lift up again. Otherwise, it essentially feels like it's falling and you're like trying to find something, you know? But once you find that firm thing and you've compressed enough, then your body says, okay, you can lift up again. So when people are running in big padded shoes, 
you can overcome this through training and technique and stuff, but why put yourself at a disadvantage? You're basically, you're, you're, you're going to lock out. You're going to go straight legged and like the more padding you add, the worse you're going to make it. So what changed for me was I wasn't doing that now. And as you know, Sean, like I love the sandals. I'm a, I'm not the best barefooter, like pure barefooter. I'm pretty good. But like I run in five millimeter, six millimeter warriors all the time. I'm wearing them right now. I'm going to run in them today. Um, but it connects you and your, your response time is just so much faster. It's like three milliseconds to put your foot on the ground and pick it up. And, and anyway, so that changed and I could breathe and I could enjoy the experience. And now I could look around, I could see the trees, I can see the trail focus what I'm doing on doing and also have great conversations trying to run with people I think that's another important human thing right connecting with people conversating those are important things and so that all opened up sorry if that was like a long no that was amazing and it's so funny because what you're saying here is you're touching upon key concepts that we actually teach in the sports performance world sprinting is far similar to barefoot running or jogging. And I don't use the term jogging much because I feel like it was a made up term by Nike. You know, yeah. I'm going to go on my slow soccer bomb jog while I chew my gum as I jog to the gym to go on the treadmill to jog. <laughs> don't need the driving. Point is, let's just say running versus sprinting versus walking. So correct form running is surprisingly much more similar to sprinting. You're being, yeah. you're ensuring that your foot is landing directly beneath your body. You're not locking your leg. You're not overstriding, which is the terminology you were using before. And your forefoot versus midfoot is going to depend at like the speed you're trying to yeah. uh, accelerate at. Now, what you said about heel striking is so interesting because last night I was at the field and my and when I trained the flag football teams or the other sports teams I work with, so the warm up is always done barefoot. Now, even though they're about to put on cleats, at least we can make some barefoot gains and. When we do de when we deaccelerate, you have to plant your heel, and yeah. that's just the strongest proof to if you want to slow yourself down or change direction. So you're either planting your heel to deaccelerate, or you're pivoting from like from the left side or right side of your ankle, which is another form of breaking, kind of like you would do in a skiing, yeah. right? And all these yeah. things are forms of breaking. But when you wear regular sneakers, you're just breaking again and again, trying to use that little bounce effect, and it's just. So ineffective, and I think that the best way – I don't recommend that beginners just take their shoes off and start running. I think that's a recipe for disaster. That was like the Vibe with Five Fingers lawsuit back in the day. But if you want to feel what it's like to run naturally, take your shoes off, go to grass, go to dirt, go to something that just feels nice, and try to run. And you'll see – and I see this with 15-year-old girls or guys who have never taken their shoes off before. They're like, ooh, this feels weird. But they're automatically – midfoot striking or automatically forefoot striking depending on their uh you know gait and goal and weight and whatever it is so now my question for you the, go real ahead. quick the vibram the vibram study i think that was like a full-on setup by somebody else and that's yeah. how industries <laughs> are they hack each yeah. other but and it it was it, the fact that you get injured like what injury how injured whatever mm -hmm. that's it that was like a nothing thing to me um it, yeah but um and actually Vibram did a study with Daniel Lieberman and they, they put people in the sandal, in the, the five fingers and they didn't give them any instruction. Mm. And, you know, they checked their gait over six or their foot strike over six weeks. Mm -hmm. And they found that like basically everyone changed their foot strike. Wow. Automatically. Which is really cool. That's really I mean, cool. it was done, it was done with Vibram and Lieberman, but I, I trust Lieberman and it makes sense right. to me. They just, you automatically had to start relearning. You, you right. Well, run. I totally agree with that. I agree that it's a learning curve and I agree that if you put the people on short distances, they'll be fine. But we get these like pro marathoners, oh, right? Yeah. Who are running distance. And then they're like, oh, Sean, I heard about the barefoot thing. What shoes should I get? I say, <laughs> uh, stick with your shoes for now. Let's transition you yeah. to ultras. Let's transition you to lens. Kind of like, and let's strengthen your foot for the next six months. In fact, if you really want to transition right now, um, you're not going to be running that distance for like a couple of months. I'm going to put you back at two kilometers. And they're like, but wait, the, the Boston Marathon is in a month. So I'll tell them, <laughs> no. you stay with your shoes and I'm going to try to uh, teach you new gait, like a new gait pattern. Or if I feel that they're uh, 
suitable for it. Maybe I'll switch them to ultras, which is like, you know, that's still cushion, which I, I, I don't, I don't recommend them for more advanced bifidors. I once tried them on for the kick set of it. And I'm like, this is so much cushion just because something is zero yeah. drop. Exactly. As you said, even if it's zero drop, even if it's wide toe box, you completely lose proprioception. So you lose ground feel and you lose the ability to run correctly. But there's kind of this graph, depending on how much distance they're running. I think the ideal is every marathoner or distance runner can get to a point where they can run in minimal shoes or sandals or barefoot. But that can take many years to build to. So there's kind of this divide. I 100% agree with that. Yeah, I was just saying that only point I was trying to make is it will something will change. You can't run heel strikes, but whether you should jump in the marathon, absolutely not. You know, um, uh, one of the things that happens to people too, like maybe from a training perspective, you can comment on this, is that people get excited. They're like, they feel this different thing and you will. I, I, I actually recommend people start out like on clean asphalt or, or concrete, like something flat in a neighborhood, a really nice, you know, um, uh, a, a sidewalk, something like that, and or a, or a running path, and completely barefoot, and uh, and then you just um, go slow and just feel the difference. And usually it takes like a half mile or a mile until you calm down, you relax, and you settle in and you start padding just right. But you you know you almost have to like shut yourself off. You have to get into that zone thing. Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, but yeah, I. Uh, don't just jump into it because you will yeah. basically like the first couple miles might be great, but then once the exhaustion hits in, hits your muscles, then you'll drop into terrible movement yeah. patterns because Absolutely. you just can't, you can't maintain that form. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up the podcast in a few minutes, but I want to ask you, so what's your number one advice for uh, barefoot, uh, barefoot runner beginners who are just starting out either Runners who have been running in shot, you know, Nike, Adidas, footwear for a while, or people who are just starting to run again, but they want to do it the correct way. So what's the transition? What do we do? Well, I think maybe the first thing you should do is, I mean, you have to find a mileage that is very easy for you. So if you're running like 10 miles a week in your shoes, then maybe you should try like three of those miles a week in your I think that's like safe like I don't think you're going to hurt yourself after a mile or two personally um and so like just add if you're running three miles three times a week then turn it into one of the take your shoes off for one of the miles and run barefoot or bring your sandals along and run in your sandals for a mile of those and um and then also just get comfortable living in the sandals or the minimalist footwear like you don't have to run just like walk and uh, and just go through the day and do your activities and your movements and take your shoes off as much as you possibly can. Take your sandals off as much as you can. It's very good for you. Um, so I, I'd say start there. Just get comfortable living in them because you're building more strength there than you realize. I mean, I think Vivo Barefoot did the fascinating study on shoes about six months of wearing minimalist footwear you know, increases your foot strength by like exponential amounts. And that's crazy because they did this study not on barefoot, not on the completely unshod, but wearing barefoot shoes. And that's like their pitch. And that's kind of the marketing, I wouldn't say ploy, but that's the push behind barefoot shoes. And like, yeah, I, the way I see it, if someone's new to barefoot, if, if they're not a runner, I say, don't even start running, take your shoes off at home. And then yeah. take your shoes off to take out the garbage. And then next time you go to play with your kids in the park, take your shoes off there. And then have as much hours a day of unshod time on different textures. And then when you do have a, a 5K barefoot or a minimalist, if you're keeping up your you know, aerobic, general aerobic capacity and general tissue endurance, you'd be surprised how much your foot can handle. Like, yeah. I wouldn't call myself a runner. I'm still in the 20-year-old Joss stage where I'm playing yeah, yeah. 11 sports a week. But yeah. I will gladly do a barefoot half marathon with you with no shoes because... I spend enough time barefoot every day on various textures under load. I train in the gym with heavy weights. Yeah. I rock barefoot, which we can get to in a second. I run, I would say once or twice a week. I play mini sports. I sprint barefoot. So all these add up to many barefoot points where the tissues of my feet and my, and my hips and knees, my whole body has adopted 
to be able to take on most barefoot challenges. And this is like yeah. the power of that is undervalued in the barefoot world. It's not just let me go barefoot running. I'll get better at barefoot running. Yeah. Let me strengthen my feet as a whole and get them used to barefoot level 5,000. And then you'll be surprised at what you can do. Like you'll play rugby barefoot and you'll be like, whoa, you know, I could do this. I'm yeah. testifying to that. I don't recommend it. <laughs> okay, that's um, my next thing is, my, if I can ask, because I actually did this today, sure. I went on a weighted rock barefoot. So I have like my 18 kilo okay. uh, vest, which is about 50 pounds, I believe. And everyone's looking at me like I'm crazy. Although it could be, um, you know, I was wearing like a, a, you know, like the Arab garb, like the kafia. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'm wearing a, a weight vest, a blue kafia. And I'm also, <laughs> I'm also mic'd up because I was making a video about, about weighted rocking. Okay. So I'm thinking, I have wires poking out of my weight vest. I, <laughs> I hope no one I calls. I see where you're going with this. I see where you're I'll going. I'll send you a video. It's pretty funny. I'm like, I hope no one calls. Like, I'm also in Israel, you know, Middle East. I hope no one calls the cops on me. But it was a great hike. I did some foraging as well. And people ask me quite a lot, like, is it safe to run or walk barefoot with weight? Especially as a former, like, military member. What what were your what are your thoughts on that in general? Okay, I have I think it's totally fine, totally safe. It always just comes down to your training. Where how how much have you trained? But I to give you an example. I had like a forty pound pack, and I've backpacked in the sandals a number of times. I did like I did this one hike. It's called the Ray Lake Loop in Kings Canyon. And uh, you go from 5,000 feet to almost 12,000 feet and then back down again to uh, 5,000. And, you know, I did it all. I only, my only suggestion is like, I don't like the really thin sandals in that situation. Mm. And this kind of goes back to what you were talking about. Like we were talking about too much foam or squish. Um, I like our mountain goat. I like our Ibex because they don't squish too much. There's a little bit, but it creates a flat platform. And so like when you have heavy weight and you have like a rock and now you're like undulating over the rock, it gets exhausting. It can be tiring. And so I feel like the thicker sandal there is good because it, it just gives you like, it lets you kind of bridge the gap with a flat surface. Mm -hmm. So you're still on a flat surface. It's still minimal. Your, your foot's still moving around. It's still handling the force of the load. It's just not having to deal with every little piece of gravel. Mm. on a 40 mile trip that's fascinating so you're saying that firm and flexible is better than very thin and too flexible when we're talking like resilient three-day hike and you kind of want to maximize your energy yeah you know anya just had a i watched her on uh the tfc podcast and mm. she said her her last qualifier was actually the thickness of the of the sand of the footwear and i agreed with her because you again like if i'm walking on my deck barefoot right, right. is that any different than walking on my thicker sandal barefoot right Absolutely. not much different Absolutely. so i mean obviously you know flexibility is is key it's critical it's important but i'd rather have like a wide toe box and my foot's moving right mm -hmm. on a flat platform i think that's you yeah. know that's good yeah, um, I totally agree with that. I think that sole thickness, especially as the barefoot of you know, me and Anya are buddies. Um, I think that sole thickness is the last category simply because it's so specific to the function you need it for. And as long as it has the right texture for the terrain you're about to take on, sole thickness could be anything from like three millimeters to like 15 millimeters. But there's still two things that we have to address. And this kind of is the conversation of like barefoot, right, which will be next podcast. Complete barefoot running versus minimal sandal running. The thicker the sole is, the less proprioception you have. Yeah. Completely barefoot versus one millimeter is not the same because there's just something about your bare skin to the floor that feels everything, feels the rocks, feels the thorns, feels the glass and the grounding aspect, right? You still want to expose your feet to bare earth as much as possible. Um, Dude, Sean, did you open up like the biggest can of worms ever at like the end of the podcast? Uh oh. So we have one minute left. So that will be round two. Definitely now that the Wi Fi is set up, looking forward to that. But what you said about the, the ground feel is fascinating because I've hiked like thousands of kilometers with no shoes. And I've also hiked thousands of kilometers with minimal issues, shamas, earth runners. When yeah. I'm wearing something very thin, like let's say the new Sedona, which I haven't, it's pretty new to me. So I haven't hiked extensively with it yet. 
I'm so fatigued. Like 30 kilometer hike and the guy wearing his sore sandals or Teva's next to me is like, Sean, hurry up. And I'm like, I'm trying. I'm going my <laughs> fastest. There's something about, you just, I just learned something new about how your foot has to like contour to every rock and you're just much yeah. slower. I, yeah. I do think, I do think though that running barefoot has more impact and load on your body than rucking barefoot just because of the bounce effect, like jumping up and down. That's just my general, I, I spoke about it in the video today. I'll post the reel tomorrow probably because there's like 300% of force on the eccentric load as you jump up and down in a run versus just walking with weight. It obviously depends on how heavy the weight is. Um, yeah. Final thoughts. Any last? Uh, wow. Those are all great things to think about. Um, dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun. I don't know if I can answer any of that right now, but just to say that um, take your shoes off uh, as much as you can. Buy some Shama sandals, obviously. Hell yeah, uh, Shama sandals. We'll link that shameless, in the show notes. Shameless plug. No, there's a lot of great companies out there. I'm just stoked on where the industry is going. And I'm, I love this conversation. And uh, yeah. I want to I wanna have the second half of it and give it some more time because those Absolutely. are great questions, man. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's always a great talking with you, Sean. Yeah. 